Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Sean Shevlin. Um, firstly, I would like to thank SciTech for inviting us um, uh, to present our study um, at this meeting. Um, I, this study will be presented by both myself and my colleague, Dr. McGuire. Um, and it is a study looking at the impact of COVID-19 on a hip fracture service. In terms of some background, um, I, am, I am on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean Shevlin. I'm a senior anaesthetic registrar and I'm working at the Royal Victoria Hospital Belfast, um, which is situated in Northern Ireland. I have a keen interest in medical education, regional anaesthesia and trauma orthopaedic anaesthesia, having completed an advanced fellowship. My colleague, Dr. Mark McGuire on the left of the screen is also a senior anaesthetic registrar also working in the Royal Victoria Hospital, Belfast. He is currently completing his final year of training and, and is doing advanced fellowships in regional anaesthesia, trauma and resuscitation. We'd also like to thank the Belfast Trust for allowing us to conduct the study and the study was approved through their Quality and Improvement Board. Finally, we'd like to thank Dr. Nick Black, Dr. Kira O'Donnell and Dr. Julie Craig, three other members of our study group who helped to run the study. Just in terms of some background, Northern Ireland is uh, this little uh, speck marked by the red pointer on Google Maps. Um, it's part of the United Kingdom and has a population of 1.9 million. It's a largely rural country and the capital is called Belfast with a population of 350,000 which is where the Royal Victoria Hospital is situated. Northern Ireland is famous for both the troubles in the 1970s, but also the final construction of the Titanic. Um, and if you're ever visiting Belfast, I'd highly recommend that you go um, to the Titanic building pictured here, which is excellent. The Royal Victoria Hospital is a large tertiary referral hospital. It has 80,000 inpatients and 250,000 outpatient appointments per year. Importantly for this study, it is the Regional Trauma Centre. The Royal Victoria Hospital is famous for many things, but two things I'd like to mention is both Frank Pantridge, pictured here on the right, who was the inventor of the portable defibrillator, which we can all agree has revolutionised modern medical practice. And it is also a pioneering centre for both orthopaedic and vascular procedures in the 1970s due to the high volume of gunshot wounds which were received. It, is, it runs one of the largest hip fracture services and units in the United Kingdom, treating well over 900 hip fracture patients per year. It has three fracture theatres running daily, and it is a seven day service. And all data we, that was collected locally is inputted into the National Hip Fracture Database, which is a large independent um, database which looks at all hip fractures in the United Kingdom. I obviously don't have to discuss much about COVID-19. We all know a lot about it and it's impacted our lives greatly. But in terms of its effect in Northern Ireland, which are important for this study, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic on the 11th of March. However, it only really re um, reached the shores of the United Kingdom uh, later on, a couple of weeks later, and there was the commencement of what was commonly known as the lockdown on the 23rd of March, 2020. What did lockdown mean for our country? Um, the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom instigated a set measures in response to the pandemic in light of global restrictions trying to contain the spread of the virus, which was known as lockdown. This lockdown resulted in the majority of the population staying at home with a subsequent reduction in non-COVID hospital emissions. This caused a significant change in our working patterns and the service we delivered. And very much it was a stepping into the unknown for us. However, in hindsight, Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom was largely spared during the first surge. However, subsequently, our numbers, both in terms of amount infected with COVID-19 and mortality figures have greatly increased 
The aim of this study was to analyse how the initial surge of COVID-19 and with this associated lockdown impacted patients presenting with hip fractures to this tertiary trauma centre. In addition, we aim to describe how the COVID-19 pandemic affected patient demographics, perioperative uh, management and outcomes. So why do we think outcomes might be impacted by COVID-19? Well, clearly this classic patient presenting with a hip fracture is generally old and frail and with multiple comorbidities, something which runs hand in hand with patients who present with severe COVID-19. But not just that, as I've alluded to in the previous slide, um, the impact of lockdown um, and, the, the, and the result of the increasing amount of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland resulted in significant institution, institutional changes in our unit. In anticipation of the increase in the amount of patients with COVID-19 requiring hospital treatment, there was a significant reallocation of um, theatre staff to increase local critical care bed capacity. This had a result in knock on effect with reduced capacity to deliver many of the urgent and expedited services normally delivered on the Royal Victoria Hospital site, which included the trauma and hip fracture service. In addition to reduced theatre availability, changes in our normal day to day practice were negatively affected, which resulted in a reduction in theatre efficiency. Examples would include us waiting, having to wait pre-operative COVID-19 swabs, which initially took a significant time. The time taken to don and off personal protective equipment for staff. As I've alluded to, there was a general reduction in the amount of staff available in the trauma theatre. And there was no movement in and out of theatre allowed whilst operating, although that may have changed in our practice now. At the time, we deemed that the best thing to try and reduce um, risk to both staff and to patients. There was also the concern um, whenever we performed some form of airway manoeuvres um, as part of the general anaesthetic of um, aerosolisation and uh, this, was, this is widely known as aerosol generating procedures. As a result, whenever any of these aerosol generating procedures were performed, there, was ha there had to be allowance of significant sufficient downtime in theatre um, to allow um, these droplets to drop to the ground and again to reduce the risk to staff and patients. All of this reduced the efficiency of our theatre, um, reduced the, we, we, um, which we presumed may reduce um, the efficiency of this, the fracture service that we could provide. And we thought that this may impact on the outcomes of these um, elderly, frail um, hip fracture patients. So what about the study design? It's single centred um, just on the Royal Victoria Hospital site. It was a retrospective observational study and we used a two month period from the onset of the first lockdown, which was like we've um, discussed in previous slides was the 23rd of March to the two weeks following that on the 23rd of May. To try and make our results more powerful, um, we decided to compare this to previous years. And so we looked at the years 2015 to 2019 and we looked at um, the, the patient court over that those same two month periods from the 23rd of March to the 23rd of May to try and reduce um, potential interpatient variability. So we looked at the same sort of time periods in terms of the year, because um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, the, both the, um, the amount of hip fractures which present to the hospital greatly increased during the winter months. So we wanted to make sure that we looked at this, looked at a similar um, we looked at a similar um, period in the year whenever we compared both pre-COVID patients to post-COVID patients. Now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Mark McGuire, who's going to discuss um, uh, the exclusion exclusion criteria and then discuss um, both the results um, and the conclusions from the study. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So the main uh, Inclusion criteria included those aged 60 or above who were admitted to the Royal Victoria Hospital with a hip fracture. Uh, we are aiming to select a typical frail elderly hip fracture patient for this cohort. Uh, and for that reason, we excluded anyone with a high energy, energy, high energy injury. 
any pathological fractures as they tend to have worse outcomes or any patients who underwent surgery in other units prior to admission. Um, we had repurposed some local elective orthopedic theatres to provide anaesthesia for younger hip fracture patients who went, underwent total hip replacements. But again, we didn't feel like this met with our frail fracture cohort, so they were also excluded. With regards to data collection, details of demographics, operative or non-operative management, time from admission to surgery, anaesthetic type and ASA grade were retrieved from our hospital's inpatient fracture uh, database known as the Fracture Outcomes Research Department or FORD database. This database contributes to the National Hip Fracture Database, which allows us to compare our outcomes with other centres within the UK. As already mentioned, the primary aim of the study was to assess how patient demographics, perioperative management and patient-based outcomes differed pre and post COVID-19 by comparing a 2020 cohort group to the similar time period from 2015 to 2019. There were four key outcomes that are commonly measured in hip fracture populations and we've included them in this study. The percentage of patients who undergo operative management. We aim to fix every hip fracture, even if only for palliative intent um, or for pain control. We also looked at time to theatre as a measure of our overall efficiency, 30 day mortality and our anaesthetic technique. We then performed a specific subgroup analysis of COVID positive versus COVID negative patients from our 2020 cohort to try and determine if there are any outcome differences. The COVID status was determined by polymerase chain reaction test for SARS-CoV-2 from paired nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs as per our national guidelines. We've included a table from our uh, paper which uh, describes some of our baseline characteristics and also some of the outcome uh, measures that we have already mentioned. If we look at the first red box, we can see that we had 20, 20, in, in 2020, we had 126 patients admitted. This compares with an average of 114.8 over the five preceding years. If we go on to look at our patient demographics, they look broadly similar between the two groups. And specifically looking at 2020, over Almost 90% of our patients with a hip fracture were ASA grade three or above, which goes on, which uh, suggests that our patients have a significant associated comorbidities. And again, it is not therefore not surprising that these frail patients remain at significant risk of sustaining a fall and subsequent hip fracture despite the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. It is encouraging that we were able to operatively manage 97.6% of our hip fractures. This compares with a baseline average of 97.9% in the preceding five years. Of the three patients who were not operated on, they were all felt to have had a palliative process and were in the active stage of dying and therefore uh, and operation was not felt to be in their best interests. Time to theatre actually reduced during the 2020 cohort. Our anaesthetic type suggested a statistically significant increased use of spinal anaesthesia when compared to the preceding years. And encouragingly, our 30 day mortality was statistically unchanged when comparing the two groups. This next slide, I want to look more specifically at the conduct of our anaesthetic. Here we are comparing spinal anaesthetic in the red versus general anaesthetic in the blue over the previous six years. And as you can see, there is a general trend towards an increase in spinal anaesthetic versus and a subsequent decrease in general anaesthetic. To give some background, there is currently no strong prospective evidence 
that either a general anesthetic or a spinal anesthetic confers a mortality or morbidity benefit to hip fracture patients. However, as Sean has already alluded to, during the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have been trying to reduce our aerosol generating procedures to prevent uh, transmission from patient to staff. There's lots of debate about what exactly constitutes an AGP. However, very much felt that a spinal anesthetic avoids any risk of an AGP when compared to a general anesthetic. And as we've mentioned in 2020, 87.8% of our patients underwent a spinal anesthetic, which was statistically significant when compared to a 69% average in the preceding five years. However, I think what this chart does go to show that it's not a sudden change and that there has been a general trend towards an increase in spinal anesthetic within our department over the last number of years. And this has potentially confounded this result. So in summary, when comparing our pre and post COVID-19 cohorts, the number of admissions has remained unchanged with 126 patients admitted in 2020 compared to 114.8 average over the preceding years. The majority of our patients remain frail and elderly, as already discussed, and we have demonstrated a statistically significant increased use of spinal anesthesia. Our efficiency improved during the 2020 cohort. We hypothesize that this may be due to the lockdown restrictions, reducing other uh, fractures uh, in our um, in our trauma unit and allowing a greater proportion of our fracture hip fracture patients to be treated sooner. And as we've already mentioned, our 30 day mortality has remained unchanged. We will now look more specifically at the subgroup analysis of our COVID-19 positive patients. Nine of our patients or 6.8% of them tested positive for COVID-19. This is lower than other studies carried out at the same time in the UK and does suggest an overall reduced prevalence in Northern Ireland. All were managed operatively and all were managed with a spinal anesthetic. However, there was a significantly higher mortality of 22%. We do recognise that these are small numbers and this may limit some of the conclusions that we can make from these figures. However, if we now look at other publication uh, produced at around the same time period as ours, which looks spe specifically at mortality in COVID positive patients undergoing surgery. In Northern Ireland in 2019, we had accrued 30 day mortality rate for hip fracture patients of 5.4%. In contrast, the average 30 day mortality patients 30-day mortality of patients who were positive for COVID-19 in this large study published in The Lancet for any surgical procedure was 23.8% with adjusted analyses showing a significantly increased risk for patients over the age of 70 or those who were ASA 3 or above, which very much matches the patient cohort in our study, which then leads for us to suggest that the 22.2% mortality in our study is comparable. Some of the take home messages. Generally, our study shows that we were able to maintain an effective service with preserved outcomes throughout the pandemic. The fact that our 30 day mortality rates were comparable in this study demonstrates the ability to maintain high standards of care despite the numerous organisational changes that were required during the COVID-19 pandemic. 98% of our patients were managed operatively with 88% of those under spinal and again this suggests a trend towards increased spinal anaesthesia with an aim to reduce our aerosol generating procedures. Our time to theatre actually reduced, showing that our efficiency remained high. And although we had small numbers, we were able to, to determine that testing positive for COVID-19 demonstrated a significant increase in 30-day mortality, with COVID-positive patients having nearly 10 times a higher mortality than COVID-negative patients. 
and this broadly matched with other described mortalities in other studies. And this does warrant the need for further research as it brings some ethical considerations for how best we manage COVID positive patients who have a hip fracture. For example, do we delay the timing of surgery to allow them to uh, improve from a respiratory point of view from a COVID-19 um, infection? Or do we consider not managing all of these patients operatively, given the fact that they have such a high mortality? So there's many more questions that need to be answered from this. We've included a QR code, so if anyone wants to scan it, they will have access to our publication, which remains at open access at present. We've included the list of our references. And we'd just like to thank again SciTech for giving us the opportunity to present uh, at their conference. Um, if anyone has any questions, both uh, myself and Sean have included our personal email uh, addresses, so feel free to contact us and we'll answer uh, your questions as best as we can. But thank you again. Thank you.